This podcast is brought to you through support from our partner, the Kaliapea Foundation. The Kaliapea Foundation envisions a future grounded in compassion, respect, dignity, reverence for nature, and care for each other and the earth. Other programs supported by Kaliapea include the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance and Led to Life. To learn more about Kaliapea's mission, visit kaliapea.org. Hey for the Wild community, it's Ayana here, and we are about to share with you an encore episode of Lila June on the final years of patriarchy while we get ready for our in the field episodes, which I am so excited and have such a full heart to share those with you. I have been traveling up through Cascadia to Alaska for the last few years and recording some incredibly intimate conversations with people on the front lines who are dealing with some of the most massive resource extraction projects in the world. So stay tuned for the In the Field episodes dropping soon. They say that history is written by the victors. But how can there be a victor when the war isn't over? The battle has only just begun, and Creator is sending his very best warriors. And this time, it isn't Indians versus cowboys. No, this time, it is all the beautiful races of humanity together on the same side, and we are fighting to replace our fear with love. Today we are continuing our conversation with Lila June, poet, scholar, and Frontlines activist. You can find part one of this episode on forthewild.world. I'd like to kind of transition the conversation and talk about resistance and, um, you know, I saw that you were just at Standing Rock, and that's been such a powerful movement that has brought so many people together. And and specifically right now, I'd like to talk about women and resistance and the meaning of that for you. Women have nurtured the earth and new generations for thousands of years, even as patriarchal culture has attempted to spread a wave of shame and silence over us through violence and oppression, we continue to heal and protect life. And I would love if you wouldn't mind sharing your thoughts on how the history of women as nurturers and life givers holds deep significance within the environmental resistance and activism movements that are taking hold. Wow, that's a beautiful sentiment and a beautiful question. (sighs) Well, I can't really answer this question completely without explaining why women are so central to sustainability and how my personal life has taught me that. As a young woman, I experienced a lot of abuse in ways that women should never be abused. And it didn't really take the form that we conventionally think of when we think of sexual abuse. I guess we think of drugs being involved or forcefully holding someone down or something like that. But oftentimes my abuse was more subtle than that. It was more guilt driven. Like uh, if you do this, you'll make me happy. Or if you just would do this, you will prove your love to me or things like that, you know? So it wasn't really like I was fitting the conventional definition of rape, but it was rape nonetheless. I also experienced the drugging kind of rape too. And (laughs) probably every different kind you could could experience. But growing up, that desecration, you could say, of my body really impacted me and it impacted those around me because I thought that to be desecrated was to be desacredized, as if your sacredness could be lost. And it took me a while to realize that there is nothing anyone can do to my body And for that matter, there's nothing so horrible that I could do that would make me unsacred and that I am sacred. I'm still sacred. I always will be sacred as the day I was born. You hold a baby girl in in your arms and if there's anything, even in this sacredless society, you can tell that she's sacred. Something about this baby is sacred. And to know that I still have that same sacredness after all people have done to my body was really helpful to me. And the way that people around me were affected, well, the men, they want the women to be safe. They want the women to be 
happy. You know, the little boys, you know, they come into this world oftentimes with a very fierce love for their mothers and they want them to be safe. They want them to be happy. And if they watch their mothers get hurt or their sisters get hurt, oh, there's nothing that could incense a man more than that. And what's even worse is when he blames himself for it. Like, oh, I could have done this. I should have done that. I could have locked the door. I could have called the cops, blah, 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 blah. I could have beat him up. And same way that a woman says, oh, it's my fault. I got raped. I should have done this. I should have done that. I should have said this. I should have said that. And so we question ourselves. And if we have fulfilled our duty as either mothers or fathers, and so, and if I've been raped and I cooperated with that rape, then I've disgraced my body somehow. And the men say, if the women got hurt and I cooperated with them getting hurt somehow by not being a good enough protector or being good enough this or that, then maybe I've lost my humanity. And the moment we believe we've lost our humanity is the moment that we implode as an individual and we don't allow the greatness that wishes to come through us to come through us. We don't allow ourselves to shine and to bloom and to sing out the song that was written into our DNA, each and every one of us. And so it's like a human walking at 10%. Because if you believe you've lost your humanity, which I did believe, you don't allow yourself to fully speak at 100%, fully walk, fully think, fully express your truest, most beautiful self. Because there's so much shame. You think, how could someone like me do this? And so rape is a very profound tactic of oppression because it kind of kill two birds with one stone you take out the woman and you take out the men who love her because they feel like they've made some mistake and so like even when I talk to my my male family members about what happened to me they just get so oh they just don't want to believe it happened because even though they weren't even there they still feel like it's their fault and so when we heal the women we conversely we feed two birds with one scone because we're feeding the woman and we're feeding the men who love her and we're uplifting the woman and we're indirectly uplifting the men who love her. So with the women being healthy and whole and they start to see how precious they are, how beautiful they are, they can start to express their gift as I was lucky to be able to get sober and to heal from the rape, which I didn't really need to do anything to heal. I just kind of needed to realize that there was nothing wrong with me and boom, I was healed. <laughs> then I was able to truly be all that I am. And so if we help the women, we help everything. And the Cree have a proverb that says, a nation is not defeated until the hearts of the women are on the ground. Because they knew that ultimately it was the women who were the pillars of the society. And what you have then is you have a converse of that, which is a, a nation can be restored if we uplift the hearts of the women off the ground. And obviously you get into a lot of philosophical debates about gender binaries there, and I haven't quite figured out how to tackle that debate, even though I myself believed I was gay for a long time, but kind of realized that that was me wanting to be male because I thought being female was a curse. So that's a whole nother story. But I don't want to avoid that conversation, that debate of the gender binaries and is that accurate, is that right, blah, blah, blah. There's an important question. I don't know how to answer that right now. But anyway, forgive me for not interrogating that issue, but if we go back to sort of this world where womanhood and manhood, which to me doesn't mean skirts and lipstick or monster trucks and big muscles or anything like that, it means more like can you birth a human being out of your body. That's how I define woman. Do you have that ability? And even if you don't, maybe you had a hysterectomy or something, but you came to this earth ready and willing to try, you know, that makes you a woman in my eyes. Uh, whether you want to wear baggy pants or a skirt is a whole nother thing. But so in terms of women being leaders of the resistance, if you will, by and large, Women, this is a big generalization, generalization warning. Women lead with their hearts. And 
women have a very intimate connection to the children, not only their own children, but because they've raised children or they have ability to raise children, a propensity to raise children, they also feel the needs of other children as well. And so if our movement is designed to create a hospitable world for the next seven generations, then the women is probably who we should be talking to because they have an innate and intimate connection to when children need to use the bathroom, when they're hungry, when they need to sleep, what they're going to need to grow up into adults. They have a very keen understanding of this, especially the grandmothers, because the grandmothers have not only seen it happen for them, they've also seen it happen for their children's children. And they're in that phase, they're in that grandmother's lodge, as my mother calls it, where they have a very longitudinal understanding that is a very long-term understanding of what it means to raise a generation from the earth. And so if our movement, in other words, is about creating a hospitable planet for our children, then we should probably be talking to the women. And moreover, we should probably be talking first to the grandmothers. And that's how it was in the old days. The grandmothers were the leaders of the society because not only did they have that motherly nature, but they also had just been here for a long time and seen a lot of things and learned a lot of things through experience. And so they were the ones who chose people to take certain positions of leadership. They were like the leaders of the leaders. And so it all comes back to life. It all comes back to the fact that we are here sitting, breathing, opening our eyes, seeing, and that this miracle that we call life is enabled by the woman's sacrifice to carry and birth us, which if you've ever been in a birth, it is not easy. <laughs> it is not easy if you've ever birthed someone or been around someone who birthed someone when they birthed that someone you will have a profound respect for all mothers because that act of birthing is hard it's difficult it's painful but it's worth it because at the end of it you have life and so if our movement is about life then we probably should be talking to the ones who bear life having said this some movements aren't about life. Some movements are about revenge. Some movements are about winning a race. Some movements are about winning a game. And maybe that's why those movements are not led by women. Because at the end of the day, they're not about life. And we need to be careful to not slip into that. Because the no dapple movement is about water, which is about life. Water is life. And so if, if we slip and we stop fighting for water and we start fighting against the police, against the governor of North Dakota, against Trump, against the oil industry, if we start to fight as a sense of revenge or a sense of we have to win this one for our own pride, for our own reputation, against Trump, against the police, that's a different movement. We need to be very careful to not fall into that because it's hard. You can slip from a movement for life to a movement for revenge very quickly without noticing. And so we need to remember our movements are about life. It's about growing life, sustaining life, building life, and protecting life, honoring life, cultivating life, diversifying life, enjoying life. And so when we remember that that's what we're really here for, we remember that it's time to turn to the life bearer. What an incredible understanding of resistance and life and revenge and nonviolence and leading from the heart and womanhood. And it seems that in this resistance and this movement for life, there's a place for honoring connectedness, for honoring people's unique gifts, honoring beauty in the resistance, not coming out of this angry, vengeful, violent, destructive place. But like you said, it's for all of life and how that just completely transforms the energy 
behind the work and the movement and just how people are present. I have one hope and one question. Seek one light and one answer. Will this life take us to greater heights, or will the illusion of unworthiness grip us forever? I am asking you to put on your turquoise, the peace collecting dust behind the altar. I am asking you to step into the sunshine, the golden rays you said you didn't deserve. I am asking you to remember who you were before the wreckage. I am asking you to remember that you are that person still. I am asking you to ignore the forked tongues that clamor in your mind. I am asking you to trade them in for your favorite memory of a time that you felt alive. I am asking you to trade them in for a time that you knew without a shadow of a doubt that you are sacred. Only in such truth will you ever be able to complete your mission. For a warrior will not stand if she does not believe she is worthy to fight. Like the child of a deity, you were born to guard the sparrows. Like defenders of the crashing waves, you were born to protect the cycles. What is true will lift you higher. What is false will lay in the mind. And if that voice feels like fear, then it is the siren's lie. What is true will lift you higher. What is false will lay in the mind. And if that voice feels like fear, then it is the siren's lie. We are children of exquisite love. Let no one tell you otherwise. Finery deserves only finery. So take up that mantle once again, the one masterfully beaded by the Creator's loving hands. I am asking you to remember who you are. Trust that life is all you hoped it would be, and then it will be. You are not imagining that lightning cracking in your heart. You are not imagining that whisper urging you to sing, to paint, to sculpt, to build. It is not what you do. It is who you are. And no matter what is done or said can ever take this away. I am asking you to wear your white shell. The one that they laughed at you for. The one that they said was too clean for you. The one that reminds you who you are. Clear the cobwebs from your dreams. Rekindle all that was deemed impossible. Speak free the truth that lies caged and burning in your soul. This is not arrogance or folly if it is done in prayer for the dying. The beauty of your talents is antidote to disease. The wild and untamed expression of our God-granted gifts is the key to those ancient prisons of hopeless mediocrity. Reclaim your right to be all that you are and watch the captives run free. Unveil your glistening heart to the world, not in lust for fame, not in lust for money, but for the love of your people and for the love of this land. You are worthy to pray for these things. You are worthy to sing for these things. Practice liberation of self and of others and watch your old self burn like sweet grass in the air. Practice fighting for a life, for something that you love and no activity provided by the world will ever again compare. I have only one hope and one question. I seek only one truth and one answer. Will this life take us to greater heights, or will the illusion of unworthiness grip us forever? Children of the deities, you were born to guard the sparrows. Now, 
I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the background of the uranium mining and the extraction, the strip mining in your region and work that you've been doing in your homeland and what the mission is of the Nihigal Bay Ina movement and the role of prayer and ceremony within the resistance. Nihigal Bay Ina means our journey for life. So there you have it again, that word Ina, which means life, which coincidentally means mother in Lakota. But Ina is really our movement for not just to sustain people in the face of uranium pollution, but also fracking, coal mining, alcoholism, anything that obstructs or destructs life, of which we have no shortage on the Navajo reservation. It's the largest reservation. It spans three states. We have a massive population. I think we're the largest tribe. And we're lucky enough to be released from a concentration camp where 9,000 of us were held um, for four years. And I think about 2,000 survivors were allowed to go back home after four years. And the idea was that if our ancestors worked this hard to get back home from that concentration camp and prayed this hard so that we could be here, then why are we destroying our homeland? So, and obviously it's not just Navajo people, it's a lot of corporations that predate on our easily corrupted government and our easily manipulated, impoverished population. But we as Dene youth, Navajo youth, must take some kind of responsibility for the future of our community and our people and our culture and our language. So we started walking from Sacred Mountain to Sacred Mountain. We have four mountains. So we had four journeys, one each season. Each one lasted anywhere from a month to a month and a half. In total, we walked 1,400 miles as a collective and brought our staff around the circumference of our homeland. And to not only expose what was threatening life, but to also nurture what nurture life. And so uranium mining on the Navajo reservation has been going on for, I think, at least, I want to say, 60 years. The uranium that was mined from our southern sacred mountain was a primary source for the Cold War proliferation of nuclear weapons. And so we have actually been sort of the minions for the United States nuclear weaponry artillery and Navajo people mined the uranium because we had next to nothing. And when someone offers you a job and you're having a hard time feeding your family, you usually take that job. So um, we mined this sometimes with our bare hands. A lot of our fathers, uncles, grandfathers are dead now from cancer, from radiation exposure. But the main ultimate understanding that I think people need to have about uranium is that creator put uranium there for a reason. And there's also uranium in the Black Hills. A lot of sacred sites have uranium. Is this a coincidence or is this because uranium has a special spiritual dimension to it where uranium being that complex element that it is and that very high powered element that it is helps us to do our ceremony just like silver helps to conduct electricity. Our ceremonies involve a kind of electricity. And if we can find the physical spaces that house and facilitate that electricity, what we call the spirit, then that's where we pray. We want to pray there. So when we break something that creator has made, there are consequences. When we break the mountain that we've been praying on for centuries or millennia rather, then there will be consequences. There will be death. There will be, not because creator's punishing us, saying, oh, you broke my mountain, now you have to die, but more because creator made that mountain to help us live. And if we break what helps us live, then we're not going to live. We're going to die. So it's not a punishment, but it's just the nature of things. The world was set up perfectly to help things live. And so if we break that system, then it's going to be very hard for us to live. (laughs) And so that's what we're seeing around the globe is that people are breaking what Creator put in place to help us live. Very beautiful, intricate, complex systems that help us live. And we're just breaking them like they're nothing. We're breaking things we don't even understand. And so 
essentially, we went on this walk to expose these things and to, to let our people know, we're sorry you have cancer. We're sorry. You know, we prayed on these lands. We prayed as youth, about 20 youth walked. And we helped our people know that they're not unseen. Their suffering is not unseen. We're witnesses to the suffering. We prayed for them. We helped them. And we also learned ourselves through this process what we're dealing with. We were like scouts, modern day scouts, scouting the land, seeing what's going on. And so in terms of prayer and ceremony, you know, that was a, obviously an integral part of our movement. It was a prayer. The movement was a prayer. It was one big year long prayer. And our ancestors taught us that prayer is not meaningless mumbling of words to like the air and you're not just mumbling to yourself in the middle of nowhere. Prayer is a, a way of connecting with worlds unseen. And the scientist only believes in what he can measure and what he can see. But our ancestors understood there's a lot out there that we can't measure. There's a lot out there that we can't see. And so similarly, the scientist is missing out on quite a bit because he's only observing what he can observe. He's only believing what he can observe. But there's certain things you can't see with your eye, but you can feel with your whole body. And prayer, if you do it, if you practice it, if you experiment with it, just as the scientist experiments with thermodynamics, you can feel yourself become a battery and the charge starts to flow. And so that flow is enabled by prayer. And no one can ever prove this per se, although actually they have found some interesting electromagnetic studies with prayer and stuff. But it's more something that's meant to be felt, not something that's meant to be proven or explained. You can tell someone that you love someone, but you're not really going to know what that means until you are in love. And so similarly, we could talk about prayer and say, oh, yeah, we're going to pray, blah, 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 blah. But no one's going to really know what that means until they are in prayer, until they are in love with the world. Then they'll start to feel. And again, we've been so desensitized that we can't even feel sometimes the charge that's running through us. But through practice and experience, trying, experimenting, you start to feel the importance of prayer. And I don't think it's a coincidence that all of the most successful movements around the world take Gandhi's liberation movement or Martin Luther King's civil rights movement or Nelson Mandela's movement in South Africa. All of these movements that are, or Dalai Lama or No Dapple, all of these movements that kind of punctured the ceiling and went to a whole nother global level. I don't think it's a coincidence that they were all guided by prayer, every single one of them. And so it makes you wonder, are these movement leaders just idiots who think they're praying to something that isn't really there? Or do they maybe have something going on that we should consider, think about, and practice ourselves? Because in our way of thinking, in Diné way, prayer allows you to create the impossible. Prayer allows you to inform yourself of things that you could not learn any other way. And so prayer is a constant practice. And every morning when you get up, you ask the spirits to move through you, to speak through you, because we understand that we can be merged with bigger spirits through prayer and they can work through us. And even European medieval culture understood that through the word genius. Genius has the root word genie and genie means spirit. So the genius was not really someone who was so great, but rather they were someone who could get out of the way enough to allow the genie to move through them. So you have Mozart is considered a genius. He wasn't just writing those songs by himself. The spirits were moving through him. And so Mozart actually said, a lofty degree of intelligence is not the making of genius. Love, 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 that is the soul of genius. And so he understood that love enables the spirit. Love enables creation. And so what is prayer other than the act of loving someone? When I pray for my grandma, I say, may help her have a good day today, creator. That's an act of love. And so love and prayer are synonymous in my brain. And so if our movements are motivated by ceremony and prayer, they're going to be much more effective because we're 
merging with spirits who know more than we do, who see more than we do, and who've been around longer than we have. And they're going to help guide us. It's also kin to surrender. Prayer is kin to surrender. If we surrender and refrain from doing what Western doctrines have taught us to do, which is to pretend like we know everything, And if we don't know everything, then there's something wrong with us or we're lesser of a person. But to say, you know what, I don't know everything and I need your help, spirits. I need your help, creator. Then you are boosted to another level because now you get to enjoy the knowledge of the creator, the knowledge of the spirits, knowledge which none of us could really know in this state as a human being. And so we get to benefit from all that ocean of knowledge and they see things from a bird's eye view. So we get to partake in that really incredible knowledge and that's what makes our movements that much more effective indigenous people shine your light we are equal i remember the day i remember the days when our prayers were illegal i remember the days when being indian was lethal Yeah, we had a rough past, but get ready for the sequel. Get ready for the glorious comeback of our people. Oh, yeah. Rise up, all you warriors of love. All you answer our ancestors from above. I can feel it in my heart. Can you feel it in your blood? I can hear the sound of fire calling us to wake up, wake up. All nations rise. Rise up, cause now's your time. We don't have to hide anymore, cause now's our time. All nations rise, rise up, cause now's your time. We don't have to hide anymore, cause now's our time. With forgiveness as my bow and my prayers as my arrows, pull them back and let go. I watch them fly like sparrows, have hope. Yeah, have hope With compassion as my shield and faith Down to my marrow I will walk the pollen path Even when it gets narrow Yeah, yeah, I Resurrect Yes, you can bet That we seen the single mama Raising children on the res We seen domestic violence Tear apart what we have left We seen the alcohol Take it all and leave us dead We seen the children take their lives When they can't take the dread anymore It's a war Can't take the dread anymore It's a war No, we can't take the dread anymore It's a war No, we can't take the dread anymore. It's a war, war, but we've seen it all before. And now we know we can change it, cause that's why we were born. We know we are the ones that we have been waiting for. We are the ones Grandma has been praying for. So rise up, all you warriors of love. All you answers to the prayers of our ancestors from above. I can feel it in my heart. Can you feel it in your blood? I can hear the seven fire calling us to wake up. Wake up. Hermoso. Levántense, es nuestro tiempo. No tienes que esconderte más. Ahora es nuestro tiempo. Mujer indígena, tú eres tan sagrada. Traigas medicina de tu suelo todavía A pesar del abuso de tu cuerpo y tu tierra Respetamos tus ancestros y la suya cultura Hombre indígena Tú eres honorable y yo veo la fuerza que todavía sobrevive a pesar del abuso de tu raza venerable. Yo respeto tus ritos, tus danzas, tus padres. Somos guerreros del amor y guerreros de la paz. Sí, no vamos a escondernos más. Somos guerreros del amor y guerreros de la paz. Sí, no vamos a escondernos más. They say that history is written by the victors, but how can there be a victor when the war isn't over? The battle has only just begun, and Creator is sending his very best warriors. And this time, it isn't Indians versus cowboys. No, this time, it is all the beautiful races of humanity together on the same side, and we are fighting to replace our fear.
with love. And this time bullets, arrows, and cannonballs won't save us. The only weapons that are useful in this battle are the weapons of truth, faith, and compassion. What a mental journey that was and a journey of the heart. When you were speaking, I kept seeing this division between people that were open to this resistance of life and this way of being in love with the earth and working from that place. And then the other group, the desensitized group that's so shut down from what's been happening in the world, they can't quite see but that that's even available to them it brings me to this through uh, no fault of their own right of course thank you for saying that and so I'm kind of in this place right now of thinking about cultural healing at a large scale in order to then move through to the next step of being able to fall in love and have this deep connection and I know that much of your work specifically writing for peace and the Taos Peace and Reconciliation Council seems to stem from this place of deep love and compassion. And in the wake of a political system founded on and continually feeding off of the division and oppression of different cultural groups, it's inspiring and comforting to envision a future where forgiveness and reconciliation are within reach and form the base of our cultural relationships. The pain and the anger and trauma stemming from a violent colonial history is not easily reconciled. And I'm wondering how you navigate this and how attainable you think cultural healing and decolonization are on a large scale. And if you have any guidance for people to cultivate this type of healing within their communities. Yeah. I mean, being a hybrid, a half European, half Native American woman, which I used to see as a curse, but now I see it as a cross-pollinated being. And plants with more genetic diversity, are they're strong. So now I see it as a blessing. I'm kind of a tough little plant now. And so my hybridity, my hybrid nature has really given me the ability to see things from both sides. And obviously what characterizes my work is the interplay between indigenous cultures and European American cultures. And obviously that interplay has not been very fun, <laughs> to say the least. It's been bloody. It's been horrific. It's been sad, to say the least. But there's also other interplays that I honor, which is the interplay between African American culture and other cultures, Asian American, Muslim American. I try my hardest to honor the fact that we're all dealing with our own challenges and our own oppressions. I think that if we want to go out and create more peace, more sisterhood and brotherhood and kinship in our communities among divided peoples who judge each other and who oftentimes degrade each other, humiliate each other and then reverse humiliate each other. I think we just have to go back to the fact that love is the answer, no matter what the question. Is someone coming to you bearing flowers and chocolate? Well, love them in return. Is someone banging on your door with an eviction notice telling you that you have to move because you can't pay the gentrified rent rate? You love them again. The answer is still love because two reasons. Number one, it's productive. When we love, we are creating the opportunity for them to see their own behavior as what it is. And we're giving them an opportunity to feel love, which they might not have felt. And not only is it productive, but it also in an external sense that we're productive in spheres outside of our own, but it's also productive within ourselves because when you love and you are in a state of love, you are returned to your natural state of being and you are no longer fettered and chained by and burdened with the weight of hatred 
which is so painful to feel. And so oftentimes I've done forgiveness ceremonies where I work really hard to forgive something that was painful. And in doing so, I can literally feel a weight lifting out of my being. And as I mentioned, I've been pretty thoroughly abused as a woman in my day. And in order to heal, my mentor told me, forgive. I said, what? She said, yes, every single one of them. Forgive every single one of them. So I went back in my mind and I looked at what they really did to me. And I said, you tried to destroy me, but I love you and I don't hold it against you. If you can do that, then you can actually free yourself. And obviously I didn't tell that to them in person because they're not actually safe to be around. <laughs> but in my mind, from a safe distance, I forgave them and I prayed for them and said, I don't hold it against you. I want you to be free. That's a whole crazy medicine that liberates both the oppressed and the oppressor. So that's important. Understanding that if we see someone's hatred toward us as a inhumane, despicable thing, then does it not also logically follow that we are dehumanized when we slip into hatred towards them? Or is hatred for a perpetrator okay? You know, is it permissible? Or is it even right or desirable? These are all questions we have to answer for ourselves. But my whole argument these past few years has been our hatred for them is no better than their hatred for us. It's the same hatred because they're seeing us as enemies when really we're brothers and sisters. And so if I go into that same delusion that we're enemies, then I'm just as deluded as they are. So when we respond to it, an enemy type of behavior with a sister type of behavior or a brother type of behavior, we're reinstating the facts. We're reinstating the truth. We're dispelling the delusion and we're reminding them that, no, 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 I'm not your enemy. Remember, I'm your friend. I'm your sister. I'm your brother. And, and they sometimes they snap out of it. Sometimes they don't. <laughs> but it's better for one of us to be snapped out of it than neither of us. And so that's important forgiveness and approaching a world that thinks it's a pool of enemies and affirming that we are family is very powerful. And every time someone does this, the whole world shudders. The whole world is rendered speechless for a time. They can't even understand it. Like all Mandela did was say, no, I'm not going to put you in the same jail you put me in. And everyone was like, oh, my God, how did he do that? <laughs> He's winning prizes and all this stuff. The whole world's just like, what? Or the Dalai Lama says, we must pray for the Chinese army. And the whole world's like, what? The whole world just gets rocked. The whole model of punitive, quote unquote, justice starts to come apart at the seams. And the whole understanding of eye for an eye and revenge is just is exposed as the nothingness that it is. And we are reinstating the truth that love is the answer, no matter the problem, no matter the question, love is the answer. And so when we operate in this paradigm where it's very constructive, not only within ourselves to heal ourselves, but also outside of ourselves. Okay, the last thing I want to say on this question is I was raised to believe that European Americans were arrogant, privileged, heartless fools. I'm sorry to say that. I know those aren't easy words to hear. And I don't believe those are true. But that's what I was raised to believe. As a Native American, half Native American, who was raised all Native American, I guess you could say, in terms of custom and worldview and belief, I was raised to believe that, that they were heartless. And of course, that's the form of racism, because you're putting all European Americans in one box and saying they are this. And those types of generalizations are very harmful because they're not true. And so then I started to dig deeper and say, wait a second, I'm half European. There's got to be something going on there. There's got to be something that I need to understand about who and what I am. So I started to dig deeper into the history of Europe. And I was blessed to discover that there are great wealths of wise cultures in Europe. 
and earth-based cultures, cultures that were extremely connected to themselves and to the earth and who were matriarchal, actually, and who placed the goddess in center stage. And we think of Europe as 1000 AD and after. That pretty much dominates our understanding of what Europe, quote unquote, is. You know, Napoleon, King Louis, the British crown, blah, 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 all these things, right? But those things are so recent. That past is so recent. And if we scratch the surface, we find that Europe was beautiful, had beautiful, incredible cultures that thrived off of the nurturing of the earth, the nurturing of women. And we also find that in German soil, they found a 40,000-year-old figurine that was of a woman. And you find these all over Europe of the goddess, you know, the honoring the goddess of the earth and the fertility of the earth. And again, the life, the life bearing ability of the earth and of women, because she always has a big stomach and big breasts to feed her children, a pregnant belly, you know, so they're, they're honoring life. 40,000 years old. This is how long European cultures have been honoring the earth. Now, there's a very important stage in European history around the year 1000 up to about 1500. You see a lot of major shifts. And the most important shift that I always bring up is the destruction of European indigenous women because they estimate and the burning times that about six to nine million European women were burned alive drowned alive, dismembered alive, raped, beaten, or tortured, or multiple of those at once. And so it's really important to understand that just like they tried to destroy the women of our communities in in America as a war tactic, so too did they try to destroy the women of Europe as a war tactic. Because when you destroy the women, you destroy the whole thing. So it's very important to understand that capitalism is a expression of the pain of the destruction of indigenous European women. And that these indigenous European women were so brutally treated, worse than Native Americans were by far, believe it or not, that the men who loved them went insane. And the only way to try and relieve that insanity was to try and compensate in other ways, to find meaning in the accumulation of wealth, to find meaning in becoming a high reputation, to find meaning in domination. And so we have to understand that capitalism and colonialism are a direct outgrowth of the abuse of the women of Europe. And once you understand that, it's much easier to forgive. It's much easier to honor the fact that, you know, Europeans didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, I think I want to commit genocide on the whole continent of people. You know, that didn't happen. People didn't just say, oh, I would love to just destroy millions of people today. That is a form of psychosis that only comes from deep intergenerational trauma, a deep, painful wound in the side of Europe, which which is the destruction of the women. And so, If we understand that, we can have compassion as Native Americans. We can have understanding as Native Americans. We can have forgiveness. We can have kindness. We can have a prayer even, a deep prayer for European Americans. And all of a sudden, they don't look like such a a winner anymore, do they? They don't look like they're the ones who came out on top, do they? They look like they're the ones who were so brutally beaten that they forgot what they were and so brutally beaten that they were brought to a state where they felt okay with murder and destruction. This is not being on top. (laughs) This is not being on top. This is being on the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. And we need to help them back up. We need to help all of our brothers and sisters back up to the state of love. And how do we do that? Forgiveness and education and articulation of these hard truths. And for that reason, a lot of my music and poetry has been honoring the indigenous European women lately. So that's a very long-winded answer to your question, but that's how I see it. 
that was a very deeply explored, articulate response to my question. Thank you. And I'd actually love to end on reading a quote from a new article that you just released called Dismantling Colonialism, A Treatise on Forgiveness. Quote, Only when we love in the face of hatred, we are liberated from that same hatred. Only when we love in the face of hatred can we loosen the screws of the machine of oppression. For who stands unfazed in the face of grace? Only the expertly numb. The rest of the world, the majority, trembles in the best of ways. They are shaken. They are inspired. They are transformed. They are forgiven. End quote. <sighs> I just, I just, I am in awe and appreciation of you from this interview, from reading your work, from learning more about who you are on this earth, what you are bringing to humanity and all the species and the waters and the lands. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me and for opening up these channels Thank you, Ayana. I really appreciate it. And I have to honor the fact that a lot of these words and a lot of these writings are not my own, but are a collaboration between a lot of spirits that really want to help the world, that really want to bring healing to the world. And so I have to give them some credit and say thank you for guiding me. And also just thanks for taking the time to formulate these questions. And I hope that they can help someone somewhere. The music you heard today was the percussion voice of Edley Natai, Lila June's own works, Born to Guard Sparrows, and All Nations Rise. If you haven't already, check us out on Patreon and get a sneak peek at the bonus content and other ways of engaging with the For the Wild community. Also, check out our website at forthewild.world, where you'll be able to find action points for each of these episodes. We're so happy to have you with us week in and week out as we grow and learn on how we can be the best earth stewards as possible together. All right, until next time.